Hey there, thanks for joining me today. Um, today, I want to talk to you about why I, a lifelong Pentecostal, use a prayer book every single day for my own personal prayer and my own personal piety. Um, now, you might be asking, what is a prayer book? A prayer book is, well, what it says. It's a book of prayer. <laughs> but let me like explain it a little bit better um, b- before I go too deep into it. A prayer book is not just a book of random prayers or just short prayers or, you know, prayers that take 10 seconds or just mealtime prayers. It's not like you know, it's, it's got some of those in there. But what I mean is it's a book of, of really worship services. So um, this book that I'm holding right here is the 1662 Book of Common Prayer um, from 1662. Still got all of the, uh, the old English in there and everything. And it is filled with every possible worship service you could need as both a minister and as a congregate. So, um, you know, it's got things for funerals and weddings. Most of you have probably used the wedding service that's actually in this book. Um, It's got things for worship services on Sunday evenings, but it also has prayer services, morning prayer and evening prayer called the daily office. And that's basically what I use every day of my life. I pray the words in this book for verbatim. Now, I want to tell you more about this book, what's in it, why I love it in a second. But um, before I do that, uh, let me just kind of give you my background story and tell you how um, I stumbled into prayer books and why they've been so helpful for me, because it, it may actually connect with you as well. Um, maybe you're watching this right now and like you're just completely honest and you're like, I don't like praying. And you're not saying that prayer is bad or fruitless or useless or you despise what God's commanded you to do. That, that That's not what you mean. You're like, prayer just frustrates me because sometimes I feel like I don't know what I'm doing right? Like it's not something that I look forward to. It's not something I feel I do well. I know I'm supposed to do it, but I'm sort of going at it blind. I never really feel good about it. And it just is what it is. And that's where I was too. Um, When you're in high school, you don't really know anything. And I didn't know anything, especially about prayer. So I remember I went through this spell and I I tell my middle and high schoolers this, um, that I would pray for an hour every day. And before I begin to sound pious, it's not because I loved God and I loved praying, but I felt so guilty that if I didn't basically go in with a list and pray for everything and every person and every situation known to man, then I would be terrible. I'd be bad at praying and God would be upset with me. (laughs) So it was not like me being this like superhuman prayer guy. It was just miserable. It was, it was law instead of gospel, right? It was like, God says, do this or I'm mad at you rather than like, Hey, prayer is a really good gift. Let me give it to you. And so I felt this burden. Like I've got to impress God. I've got to make God happy with this prayer. And, um, I need to pray for everything. And so I would dread it and I would like push it off till late at night. And then I'd pray and I'd go for it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is miserable. And I eventually kind of came to the conclusion, like, this is not it. But still, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what I'm doing. What am I supposed to accomplish? How long am I supposed to go? When am I going to feel good about it? How, How do I pray about different things? Like, what do I do? And so for years, like it was like this up and down, maybe I'd improve, maybe I'd not. I think I figured it out. And I'm like, I don't really know. And I remember one day I'm on my phone, And I had read some like sermons of John Wesley. I knew that he founded Methodism. I I wasn't really that informed. I stumbled across this website, and I still don't remember how, called MethodistPrayer.org. And so I'm I'm reading through it, and I'm like, oh, this is like really formal. (laughs) This is really put together. So like there's scripture reading. So my Bible readings built into this. They want me to read the Psalms. They've got a hymn by Charles Wesley like every day and these are beautiful. I'm, I'm loving this. And there's things I'm repeating. I'm confessing my sins. Like I'm praying for their people. They're giving me prayer points. Like, man, I've never done anything like this. I thought I was supposed to lock myself in a room and just go at it, right? Like get real passionate, real emotional, cry, yell, run off the list. Like this is the opposite of anything I've ever done. Like they just want me to pray the words. But at that point, like I was so done with like trying to figure out how to pray myself or, you know, figure it out. I was like, let's go, let's go for it. And so I remember I was praying methodistprayer.org like every day. And let me tell you what, it was like water in a desert. 
It was food for my soul. For the first time, I was like, this makes sense. And I didn't understand everything about it. I didn't understand the the order of it or the purpose behind it. I certainly didn't know the history behind everything that went into that, which I, I realize now. Um, but all I knew is like, there's a lot of Bible in this. This makes sense. This is saying things better than I could ever say it. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. <laughs> And so that's kind of how I stumbled onto that. And I'll try to make the the long story short. I went through some other things. I tried some other um, prayers and went to some other things until eventually I stumbled upon this, which is called the Book of Common Prayer that I mentioned before. And the Book of Common Prayer, let me give you some background, was put together by the Anglican Church over in England. Its very first edition was in 1549. This is 1662. 1549 was the very first edition, and it was put together by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, right? And so this is at the height of the English Reformation. Believe it or not, the Anglicans have a little bit more history than King Henry wanting a divorce. Like, they were bishops and priests who like actually cared about doctrine and the church and the people or whatever. One of the issues at the time was that the Roman Catholic church insisted that all worship service services would be done in Latin. Now, the problem is, is that that's not the vernacular language. People in England didn't speak Latin. They spoke English. So like, can you imagine going to church or going to pray every day and you have no idea what the priest is saying? Like you're just there. And so you can kind of imagine like how things begin to be mystical and you don't really understand it. And maybe superstition gets developed. Like, um, let me do a side note. Um, have you ever heard that phrase hocus pocus, right? Like when people's talking about magic or something like that, what that comes from is the Latin phrase for this is my body. Hoc est corpus meum. While the priest would be consecrating the Holy Eucharist, he would be saying, instead of in English, this is my body, you know, given for you, he would say, hoc est corpus meum. Well, people misheard it for hocus pocus, and that's how that kind of came about. So that's an interesting little fact. So what Thomas Cranmer does is he takes the the worship services and the prayers and all of that um, from the Latin church, and he translates it into English. And so he puts together this book of worship services and individual prayers and things like that, and he calls it the book of common prayer for two reasons. One, we can all pray it. It's in English, finally. And two, every church in the country was supposed to use this one book. They weren't supposed to come up with their own worship services, but they would be united as one church of England using the same worship services, the same words, preaching the same scripture text. It would be a commonality and a unity. And what Thomas Cramner did is he forms this in 1549. I would say that it's kind of perfected in 1662. Um, But what's so cool about the prayer book is most of the prayers in there are very old, right? They're ancient. Like they way predate Thomas, Thomas Cranmer. He's just drawing on the tradition of the church that's been passed down to him and translating it into English. And then there were certain things that him and others did come up with and did add. But still at this point, I mean, 500 years, it's pretty old at that point, right? But, but my point is that it's very, very old. And, um, and so it's pretty neat. Um, from this book of common prayer, if you've ever had been to, or you're a part of a traditional wedding, you've probably prayed the words of Thomas Cranmer. Um, they're beautiful. That's why it's stuck around for so long. And, um, and yeah, so I stumbled upon this book and I realized this is for me. Like this is it. This is amazing. And so let me tell you about it. Um, The Book of Common Prayer, the prayer services are um, broken down into morning prayer and into evening prayer. And so maybe that's like my point one. I didn't really plan this out very well. Point one why I love praying with the prayer book is it brings organization into my life. Like we are modern man. We have electricity and lights. You're watching this on technology right now. Back in the day, you had to live by God's timing by the sun. And so what they would do is every morning when it was light, you get up and before you get out to work, gather at the church and we pray together. Then as the sun's setting, the workday is over, you gather at the church and before you go to bed at night, before you're encountered with complete darkness and fear and the unknown and potential danger, what do you do? You gather with the church and you pray evening prayer. Um, Although our lives aren't like this, the idea of praying either in the morning or in the evening um, brings organization to my life, right? Like I need discipline. 
Um, I'm an okay disciplined person. I've never been like just kind of wild and just sort of out there, but I'm far from perfect. And especially when it comes to my prayer life, I need discipline. This naturally teaches me you're going to pray in the morning or you're going to pray in the evening. Those are the two principal services. And so you're going to orient your life around what this prayer book says to do. Here's the second reason that I love praying the daily office, morning or evening prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. It has been said that the Book of Common Prayer is nothing more than Scripture set to worship. Like, I love the prayer service found in this book because it is full of Scripture. In fact, I looked it up, and like the entirety of this book, I believe it's 80 to 85% of this book. I think it's 85%. I don't know. 80 to 85% is straight up copy and paste Scripture. Like straight up copy and paste out of the Bible. That's what this book is. And that's true for the prayer service as well. And then the other 15% is just a scriptural, but it may just be a scriptural illusion. If you don't believe me, I encourage you to go to a website called scripturalbcp.com. Maybe I can even add the link in the description. And it takes you through every part of this prayer book, and it actually gives you scripture citations for every little line. It is incredible. And so when I go to pray every day, I'm praying the scriptures. I open up the prayer service with the scriptures. I confess my sins, not with the scripture, but according to the scriptures. I pray short prayers, whether they're copy and pasted from the Psalms or inspired by the scriptures. I pray the Psalms, which is just scripture. What's really cool too is the Book of Common Prayer, actually, I'm gonna stop holding this. It actually comes built in with a Bible reading plan. It actually has a yearly Bible reading plan with it. So then I have a built-in organized Bible reading plan that keeps me organized and I read the scriptures. And then what's neat is after every scripture, you sing a song of praise to God called a canticle. And a canticle is a song out of the scriptures. <laughs> so when I get done reading the Old Testament, I sing the Song of Mary, the Magnificat, which you can find in the Gospel of Luke. It's literally taken right out of there. When the word of the Lord was delivered to her, just like I read the word of the Lord in the Old Testament. And then after I read the New Testament, we sing the Song of Simeon, also found in the Gospel of Luke straight up. Simeon lays his eyes on Jesus as he's holding Jesus in his arms as a baby. I've beheld Jesus in the scripture. Now I can go to sleep and I can be rest at peace. And then the, the rest of the, of the prayer book, I could go on and on and on, is just chock full of scripture. I love it because I'm praying the scriptures. Three, I'm praying the Psalms. I know I just said that, but I really want to go in on the Psalms. The, Psalm was, the Psalms are Israel's and the church's prayer book. The Psalms were designed to be sung and to be prayed both individually and communally. And they were written generally enough for people to make it their prayer and apply it to their own situations. So like you can see the Psalms of David, um, you can find the the scenario that inspired one of the Psalms, right? And um, there are matches. I, I wish I had the actual quotation. I'm sorry. But you can go to like first or second Samuel or something like that. And you can see where David goes through that scenario. And then maybe they list a song that David writes right there in first or second Samuel. And then um, it's very specific language, specific to David and specific to his circumstance. But if you hop over to, a, to the Psalms and you find, um, David writing a psalm on that same scenario, it's now more general language. Why? Because it's for God's people and it's for you to actually sing and belong to. The psalms are amazing because they're God's word. You can't go wrong. You can't pray them wrong because they're not your words. They're God's words. They're straight up scripture, divinely inspired. And so you get to pray God's perfect word back to him. And as you're praying, you get to be nourished by his word that is living and active to work in your soul, which I really, really love. I'm just going to keep going. I'm just kind of like vibing here. Um, trying to find, you know, everything that I love about it. Um, one thing that I love about the Book of Common Prayer, um, besides all of the scriptural elements, is it forces me to not be selfish in my prayer. Most of the prayers in the daily office are not about me. In fact, the first half of the daily office is just straight up worship. 
It's confessing my sins before God, and then it's worshiping him through psalms. If you were to gather in a corporate setting, there's room built in to sing songs, so like sing worship songs as well. Um, it's straight up worship. I can, I, I'm reading God's word, and I'm praising him for it. I'm confessing the Apostles' Creed, which is just a declaration that God is who he's revealed himself to be, and I believe that. That's praise. Um, and then I'm praying for other people. I'm praying for the church. I'm praying for other people's needs. It's only until the very end that I specifically, specifically pray for others and myself in my own words. It's like it forces me to not treat God like Santa Claus, but I've got to like admit I'm a sinner, spend half the time just straight up worshiping him before I can pray for other people's needs, and then I can talk about myself. It it orients me correctly. Something else that I love is that it's beautiful. And and I'm probably going to make a whole video on this little point right here. Um, But when we're speaking to God, we've got to realize he's not just dad, he's also king. So when we approach God, um, we can approach him intimately, and there's times for that, but we also have to approach him as a king, as almighty God, a creator of the universe. And so the Book of Common Prayer uses high language. It uses flowery language. Um, They are prayers that if you come in a, a bit ignorant, you would say, well, that's stuffy. That just sounds like religion. But you're praying with beauty and the beauty of holiness, coming before a holy God, bowing before his throne and honoring him. And so I like that. I like that it finds the perfect balance between intimacy with God and the necessary separation between me, a sinner, and God, a holy God who's totally other than I am. And it's beautiful, and I love it. Worship should be beautiful. We're worshiping a beautiful God. Um I love it because it prays prayers that I could never come up with on my own, that I'm not um, good enough to pray on my own. I love it because it connects me with the past. I'm praying prayers that my brothers and sisters, not just in England in the 1500s, but thousands, 2,000 years ago, you know, uh, that my brothers and sisters in the 300s prayed. Um, I take part in those prayers. And so I I join in the prayers of the church. Um, I could go on and on and on. But I pray with a prayer book because... I wasn't very good at praying on my own. I pray with a prayer book because it's scriptural. It's part of the history of the church um, that we pray uh, more organized prayers as a community, that we pray the same things, that we pray for one another, um, that we pray uh, uh, according to the scriptures, that we pray the Psalms, we pray in beauty, all of those things. And so that's why I love it. And so I would encourage you, if you want to pick a prayer book up, um, I would encourage you to get the Book of Common Prayer. This is called the 1662 International Edition. It's small enough to pack in a book bag or something like that, bring it to your work. Um, the font is pretty small, but it's not that bad. Um, if you're worried about this, oh, and one more thing, this is from 1662, so it's still the classic language. I prefer this. I prefer the 1662. I prefer the classic language um, because it's intentionally beautiful. And it, it creates that distance, that necessary distance between God without, you know, it's the healthy distance. Um, and um, that's why I like this. But if you're like, hey, I'm not about that kind of language. I'm scared. I'm not going to know what I'm saying. Like, I don't like that. There is a 2019 Book of Common Prayer with updated language. And I also have a copy of that. And the font is bigger. You can even get a very nice leather one for about $35, $40. It comes with several tassels, um, very large font. And so if that's something you're interested in, you can go find that as well. 2019 Book of Common Prayer. The Anglican Church of North America produces that. But I would encourage you, if you have a hard time with prayer, if you'd like something a little bit more organized, this is something I wish some somebody would have told me about at like 14 years old, whatever age you are, I encourage you to pick up one of these um, and, and start praying the prayers of the church. Cool. I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you on the next video.